Good evening and welcome to Devotions on this Wednesday evening uh, before Pentecost. Uh, and I'm so glad to have everybody with us, either in real time or uh, on the recording later on. Just nice to know so many people are tuning in. I wanted to share uh, this evening with uh, something. Actually, it was, it was in Time Magazine. So uh, my apologies if there are those of you who get Time Magazine have already read this because it is a national pop, pop publication. But uh, this is by N.T. Wright who is a well-known biblical scholar and theologian, professor of New Testament and early Christianity at the University of St. Andrews, uh, and research fellow at Oxford. And this is an excerpt from his uh, new book called God and the Pandemic. And this is actually an excerpt of the expert, excerpt. Um, but I think he makes a couple of good points, so even if you've already read it, it's, it's worth hearing. As restrictions on gatherings begin to lift around the world, some churches are being allowed to reopen for small gatherings, while other religious leaders are unsure of whether that's the right thing to do. And that's what we've been talking about. There are two quite different things which need to be said about opening churches, as often happens in Christian theology. We need to hear them both. First, church buildings are not an escape from the world, but a bridgehead into the world. A proper theology of sacred space ought to see buildings for public worship as advanced signs of the time when God's glory will fill all creation. Christians should therefore celebrate every way in which the living Lord whom they worship in church buildings is out and about, bringing healing and hope far beyond the visible limits of church property. And we have experienced that certainly in our time here in the pandemic. Jesus does not need church buildings for his work to go forward. Part of the answer to the question, where is God in the pandemic, must be out there on the front line, suffering and dying to bring healing and hope. But there is a second point. In those countries such as my own, where churches and other places of worship have been shut for thoroughly comprehensible reasons, there is a danger of accidentally sending the wrong signal to the wider world. For the last 300 years, the Western world has largely regarded religion, the very word has changed its meaning to accommodate this new viewpoint, as a private matter, what someone does with their solitude. The Christian faith as a whole has been reduced in the public mind to a private moment in the sense that, so many say, it should have no place in public life. Thus, I can still go shopping in the crowded little off-license, in America, the liquor store, on the corner, but I cannot go and sit in the ancient prayer-soaked chapel across the street. Worship becomes invisible. Shutting churches will appear to collude with this by saying that we will temporarily abolish corporate worship and join with others only on live stream services from the vicar's living room. We may seem to be agreeing that really, we are just a group of like-minded individuals pursuing our rather arcane private hobby. Interestingly, the signs so far are that many people have been to church in that virtual reality who would not have come to a church building, and we have certainly experienced that. But our churches have been for centuries physical and often audible reminders on main streets and in town squares on city blocks and in suburban developments of the vital dimension to life that Western modernity has tried to crowd out. We will no doubt learn many things in this time of enforced exile, which is what it is. But we should be praying towards the day when our buildings will function within our society as they were designed to do. I find myself caught between these two viewpoints, both of which seem to me right. I totally understand that we need to be responsible and scrupulously careful. I am appalled by reports of would-be devout but misguided people ignoring safety regulations because they believe that as Christians, they're automatically protected against disease. Or that, as I heard someone say on television, you'll be safe inside church before the devil, because the devil can't get in there. I wanted to say, trust me, lady, I'm a bishop. The devil knows his way in there as well as anybody else. That is the kind of superstition that gets Christian faith a bad name. 
Equally, the debates about locking churches can easily stir up lesser controversies between those for whom the building and all its bits and pieces has been a vital part of their spiritual spirituality and those for whom all such things are irrelevant since one can worship God anywhere. Both sides here may learn from the present crisis and we do well to hold one another in charitable prayer. Part of the answer to that prayer, as many have seen, might be to recognize the present moment as a time of exile. We find ourselves by the waters of Babylon, thoroughly confused and grieving for the loss of our normal life. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land, as in Psalm 137, translates quite easily into, how can I know the joy of the Eucharist sitting in front of a computer? Or how can I celebrate Ascension or Pentecost without being with my brothers and sisters? Of course, part of the point of Psalm 137 is precisely that this Psalm is itself a song of the Lord. That's the irony, writing a poem about being unable to write a poem. Part of the discipline of lament might be then to turn the lament itself into a song of sorrow. Perhaps that is part of the way in which we are being called right now to be people of lament. We talked about that too. Lamenting even the fact that we can't lament in the way in which we prefer. We need to explore those questions and the new disciplines they may demand in whatever ways we can. Perhaps, perhaps this too is simply to be accepted as part of what life in Babylon is like. We must, as Jeremiah said, settle down into this regime and seek the welfare of the city where we are. But let's not pretend it's where we want to be. Let's not forget Jerusalem. Let's not decide to stay here. This was thought provoking to me in many ways, partly just about these two sides opening the church and the realities that we face as we begin to go back to the building in one way or another. But for me, it was particularly thought provoking because of the Psalm 137. Because you remember it says, by the rivers of Babylon, we hung up our lyres. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And even when we get back into the building, we're not gonna be able to sing. We're not gonna be able to sing together for a long, long time as a group. And that is, that is something to lament. And those of us who, who work on the music of the church, uh, and are trying to find these new ways that are not our ways of, of singing together, uh, find it really something to lament and really a challenge. And it's interesting also that the psalm goes on and says our captors said, sing us a song of Zion, as though they want it for entertainment and amusement. And I think sometimes our society does that as well. You know, everybody loves to go to some big public event where they sing Amazing Grace, a song of the church, that has become part of the society, which is a wonderful thing. And yet we also need to keep singing our songs for ourselves, for the church, and to remember that they are part of who we are. And so I, I thought as we, as we look to these things, as we lament what we don't have and what we won't have for a long time, I think his point is well taken that we find ways to write a new song through this time and find a new way to sing just as Psalm 137 is a new way to sing the song of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that in this time you are here. And we thank you for our lovely church building and we look forward to getting back to it and those other church buildings which are represented perhaps in this time and place. And yet we know, Lord, you have been with us and scattered with us in this place, just as you were scattered with those disciples who went all over the world in the book of Acts and taught and spoke your word and sang your word. And so we thank you, Lord, for being in both of those places. And we pray for your wisdom as we move ahead in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. May God bless your evening.